it's 11.05, so I'm going to get started. I think everybody's on mute. So let's do this thing. So for the 2016 survey, we were able to conduct 1,223 telephone interviews. Um, we did a combination of both landlines and cell phones, which increases the cost dramatically because cell phone users are harder to get a hold of. But it's really important because we can show that that's exclusive cell phone users actually poll differently. And so you have to include both of them to get a true representative sample of opinions. The margin of error is pretty high. And that is because this is a big country with a lot of different opinions. Um, and so driving that margin of error down lower is really difficult. Um, the way that uh, I tend to think about it is that when it comes to things like forest pests, the margin of error of 4.7, it feels a little high to me. However, you have to realize that that probably is not an actionable difference. If there was a 4% difference in opinion, that isn't something that we would ever base a policy on. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, a lot of the slides you'll see have percentages and a lot of them don't add up to 100. That's because all of them are being rounded and so you often get things that add up to 104 or 96. Please ignore that. However, if you do see something that adds up to like 150, that's a math error. And um, let me know if you see any of those. Various different slides are going to compare to other surveys conducted um, during 2005, 2007, 2008, 2010, and 2016. Um, each of these surveys had different types of samples and oversamples and undersamples of different parts of the country that have to be corrected. This is where some of the multi-year comparison errors creep in. Um, I found one. I'm hoping I won't find any more, but I'm fixing them as I go. So let's get started. Okay, that does not go to the next slide. There we go. So first, let's take a look at your census divisions. These are really important because these are some of the regions that I'll be using for the data. Please write down the name of the census division that you are most interested in, as well as the one you live in, if those are different. Um, I don't find these to be particularly intuitive. For instance, I didn't think Pacific would include the state of Washington, but it does. So write it down. I'm giving you a second to write it down. The other thing I'm going to tell you is I'm on the bottom right of the slide is a little number. This one's number two. If you have a question about a slide, it's incredibly useful to me to write down that number. So you'll say, Lee, on slide two or whatever, um, that's an index number. So please write those down when you have questions. OK, so first we're going to do a little context. Um, in general, the American public thinks that economic issues are a lot more serious and concerning than environmental concerns. So the number one concern right now in America, believe it or not, you wouldn't you wouldn't know this from where our political discourse is going, is the cost of health care. Um, so these are all really important items, of course. When you get down closer to the bottom, you get to pollution, loss of habitat, etc. But then you have to go actually to page two of the issues, essentially, to reach the ones that are of most interest to the audience of this webinar, so insects that kill trees. Um, the dark green on these 100% uh, row bar graphs represents extremely, extremely seriously concerned. The sort of minty green is very seriously concerned. The kind of white blue is somewhat serious. So that's the margin at which people who are kind of on the fence are going to say. Then the brown is, I don't find this to be a serious concern. And then the sort of orange on the far right is I didn't know or I didn't answer. Um, so that's how these break down. In terms of things that people do outdoors, a lot of what they enjoy is near their house. And this will come into play for the other part of um, the presentation. So for instance, gardening, people really like gardening. They like hiking. Um, they like viewing wildlife, which can be near your house as well. And they really do enjoy going to cabins and so forth. So these are the things that the American public enjoys doing. I find it notable that 77% of the American public says that they do not find hunting um, in the least bit interesting, as well as 50% find the activity of fishing entirely uninteresting. So when we're talking about reaching vast swaths of the American public with our outreach, hunting is not the right place to hang your cap, apparently. Um, you'd actually do much better with hiking on a forested trail or bird watching. 
firewood users as a whole are a little bit different from the American public in the way that they enjoy the outdoors. So firewood users are a little more likely to garden. They're a little more likely to hike. Uh, and in fact, they're drastically more likely to fish or, excuse me, they're equally more likely to fish or hunt as some of these other categories. So it's a, it's, it's a dichotomy here. So we know that a lot of Americans don't hunt, but we also know that, for instance, more Americans that use firewood hunt than Americans that don't. Um, next up, trusted messengers of the American public. So these are the people that the American registered voters claim are trustworthy when it comes to learning about things regarding forest health. So the number one person this does not change over time is always park rangers. Of note is the fact that the American public actually doesn't really understand what a park ranger is. They just think it's somebody who's at a park with a hat on. Um, but they're extremely trustworthy. That is your ideal spokesperson. An incredibly close runner up for your ideal spokesperson is either your state's Division of Forestry employees, the U.S. Forest Service, State Department of Agriculture, or scientists. All of these people are highly well regarded as messengers. And so if you are an employee of the State Division of Forestry and you're doing outreach, you want to identify yourself as such. The preconceived notion that certainly I have held in the past, and I'm sure other people have held, that the government is not a trusted messenger because people are biased against the government, that doesn't hold up in this case. When you're talking about forest health, people do actually trust state employees and Forest Service employees. Now, when you get towards the bottom of this chart, so down towards um, local business owners and timber companies, a lot of people understand that forest opinion, or sorry, forest information from somebody that might have um, a bit of a conflict of interest could be less trustworthy. So you see that the lack of trust, the difference here over on the right hand side jumps up when it comes to business owners and timber companies. So I think people are aware of the fact that those messengers could have a conflict of interest. We've done this polling across different regions throughout the years, and it holds very true, um, of course, across lots of different parts of the United States. The only difference that we've ever seen that was worth noting, which I find really interesting, is in 2010, we found that California respects its scientists a lot more than other states do. Um, I find this fascinating. I've mentioned this in several uh, presentations through the years since 2010 when we found it. And the two explanations that everybody's kind of settled on is either it's because of the UC system being quite well regarded, the University of California system, or it might be because of the presence of Silicon Valley and the fact that people just respect science as a concept more in an area that has such a computing and technology focus. Whatever the case may be, um, scientists get a little bit of a higher bump if you do the same poll in California. So let's get into the nitty gritty of forest pests. And remember, if you have questions, I'm gonna take everybody off mute at the end. We can go through every single thing you need to go through. I should be able to get through this with plenty of time on the hour. And make sure to write down that index number on the slide. That'll help me figure out what you're really asking because these slides are really complicated. This slide index number is number nine, bottom right. Okay, so here's the slide that I found an error on just before I started the presentation. And I wanna call it out because it's actually really interesting. Um, this is data on whether or not they're con the American public is familiar with the concept of forest pests. It's like a big tent question. Have you ever heard of forest pests is essentially the question, although it's a little um, longer than that. We have a peak in 2007, and it turns out that's because of a bad sample. In 2007, we only sampled uh, the northeastern area of the United States and the Midwest, and that wasn't reflected in this slide. If you actually compare the national surveys, you have to remove 2007. And then you see a slow rise with a barely statistically significant dip by 2016. So cover up 2007 with your hands and you'll see the national attitudes. Now I'm gonna redo this slide for all my future presentations because obviously this is a really important point. Um, but when you look at regions that are parallel, you actually see just a really slow rise of awareness. You don't see that high point in 2007, which is interesting. So people are gradually, slightly becoming more aware of the problem of pests and pathogens. It's barely statistically significant. Um, and 
uh, it shows that essentially half of the country, more or less, uh, has some level of awareness that this is an issue in our trees and forests throughout the United States. Now, when you talk about the actual names of the pests, you get some interesting results. So we've been asking a question, and it goes like this. Um, I'm going to read this verbatim. I'm going to read you a list of insects and diseases that have infested trees in different parts of the United States at different times. Please tell me if you remember hearing anything about trees being infested or killed by this insect disease. And then the person doing the poll says, Dutch elm disease. And so what do we see? We see that Dutch elm disease has had no statistical change over time. People recognize it quite well, actually, um, but it doesn't really change. It's holding steady. When we say gypsy moth, we see a slight decrease. It is statistically significant, but it's not huge over the course of the last decade. I'm sure if we were doing, if I ran the data on just the state of um, Massachusetts or Connecticut for 2016, we would see a huge jump. So it depends on the sample. But as a nation, we're just going down a little bit in awareness of that one. Chestnut blight's holding really strong. Um, at about a quarter of the United States claims they've heard something about it. And we actually have pretty good data on laurel wilt, which is interesting because that's not a widespread pest in the imagination of the United States. But we can show that 10% reliably between 10, um, 2010 and the other um, numbers cut off. Sorry about that. It's supposed to be 2016. 10% um, of people are aware of the name Laurel Wilt in some fashion. Now, we're feeding people the answers here, so there is a little bit of a bias to just say, yes, I've heard of that, even if that's not true at all, um, which is something to take into account. I've been meaning to find the money to actually run the survey and give people a pest that doesn't exist, so a name that's just non-existent, to see how many people will claim they've heard of it, um, but we haven't been able to find the cash to do that because it's kind of a little bit of an interesting experiment. Now let's get to some of the pests of maybe greater concern for everybody because these are our background data. Some of the pests such as Asian longhorn beetle are showing really interesting changes both over time and also over region. So east north central census division that is Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio has actually decreased pretty dramatically on its name recognition of the Asian longhorn beetle since 2010. Um, that's pretty interesting, in my opinion. Um, I think that a big part of this is that the area that Asian longhorn beetle um, is currently well documented in the press and in our outreach efforts is a lower population level than where it used to be when it was near Chicago. So rural Ohio is going to show up much less in a poll than Chicago. So that's an interesting um, issue that people are facing in terms of awareness. Now when you look at New England from 2010 to 2016, you get more sort of vague, kind of I've heard of it, folks in 2010, which would be two years after the discovery of Asian longhorn beetle in Worcester. Um, but the hardcore people that say, yes, I've heard quite a bit of this about this particular pest has held almost entirely steady, 33% to 32%. So the folks that really are sure they've heard of Asian longhorn beetle are still sure they've heard of it, um, which probably reflects the media environment of slightly less coverage. But when people are engaged, they remain engaged over time. Interestingly, we're seeing um, more of a drop when you open up the survey data from 2010 to 2016. So a lot of people um, were saying that they had heard of Asian longhorn beetle in 2010 when you include the states of uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. That's the Northeast plus all of New England. So it's a much bigger space. But then again, it's going down in awareness by 2016. Like I said, it's possibly because this is we're getting farther and farther from the initial Worcester outbreak media push. And then in 2005, we had only a very small subsample. This is an old poll, um, and it only polled places that might have had any prayer of knowing what the Asian longhorn beetle was because of the information we were trying to gather way back in 2005. 
But in those areas that were hard, that were pretty hard hit, there was actually really good awareness in 2005. I don't have the ability um, that I know of to pull these to pull the data of these exact states for 2016. I'm going to be investigating that because I'd like to try to do that if possible. Um, but that's a tricky one to pull out a specific state from a national poll. Often the um, sample size gets too low to have any kind of statistical significance. All right, let's look at emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer is on the radar of the southern quarter of the United States now. This is a huge change from 2010, where basically a couple people <laughs> said they'd heard a little bit about it, and only a tiny minority had heard a lot about it, 2% in, in that case. 2016, people are becoming much more aware in the southern region of the United States of the, the concept, the name of the emerald ash borer, and I think that's really good. Um, so outreach is reaching those people as the outbreak moves into their region. As for the East North Central, again, I'll read those states for everybody. Um, that's Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio. It's almost unchanged between 2010 and 2016. The difference between the people who are absolutely sure at 42% versus 46% is right on our margin of error. So it's likely to be almost no difference whatsoever. And you can see that people have never heard of it in the East North Central is extremely similar to each other. They're 24% in both cases. Uh, in contrast, when you go back to 2005 to our fairly small sample of states, although all of those states, it's, um, that's three out of the five East North Central states. Again, it's an imperfect sample, but we can see in 2005 awareness was far lower in those states, 57%. Um, so they'd never heard of this pest which makes sense. So we're getting to the public here. Um, and you can see that uh, the knowledge is holding strong in one of the most deeply affected regions. And it's far higher than one of the newly affected regions, the South. Um, when you ask people how worried they are about forest pests, not the fact that they exist, but their actual, but their actual worry about them um, in our forests, that concern is going down a little bit. I'm not sure why that is. And, and in fact, with all these survey results, we don't have any sort of causation abilities because obviously correlation is not causation. We can speculate all we want. But this one is an interesting one. We had a much higher national level of concern in 2010. It is worth noting that these polls are about invasive insects, but people don't typically understand that some of the native insects are not invasive. So they may be conflating mountain pine beetle epidemics with uh, invasive insects or spruce budworm or any number of other insect epidemics. And so these results, when we talk about these big grandiose statements about insects and diseases and forests, these results specifically might be getting biased by native insects and natural cycling um, and media cycles pertaining to those. So that's one of the things I'm thinking might be going here. It also just might be that we've got bigger fish to fry in 2016, a very highly contentious election, lots of other things going on in our lives. It might be that they're just less concerned because they've got other things to be concerned about. It's hard to say, but this is an interesting um, decline. And of course, it's almost by 9% between the very concerned level um, of 2016 and 2010. So that's a pretty, it's a real drop there. So Interestingly, these concern levels vary by age, and this is something to take into account when you're doing messaging. Um, if you are talking to folks um, between 30 and 50, they frankly care the least about the issues of forest pests. The younger people are more concerned, so 18 to 29, and then folks in the range of retirees are more concerned as well. Um, so the non-retired 50 to 64 older folks and then 65 plus those people are more concerned um that's not terribly surprising we can actually break all of our data out by age and if there's anything that you'd like to see broken out by age you can email me at the end um, or you can email me now and i'll read it at the end of this presentation and i can get that data for you 
um, we see a lot of this sort of um, sway back kind of distribution in our data with concern when it, with anything almost when it comes to the different age groups. In terms of the concerns for uh, forest pests in different regions, it's interesting to see that big city people are really concerned. So big city is metropolises, obviously, like Chicago, New York City, etc. Um, and then rural areas are extremely concerned about it. But then in the middle, small cities, suburban areas, those people actually show somewhat less concern and certainly they're less willing to say they are extremely concerned. Likewise, you see, in, according to the biggest census regions, when you break the country into four separate chunks, um, concern is fairly significantly different between the different parts of the country. Um, you know, the Northeast is 11% more extremely concerned than the South, for instance. So these things are variable. All of these are the one that I'm concerned the most about with um, invasive versus native insects that might be kind of muddling up the data when it comes to the um, question of whether or not this is pertinent to invasive species. All right, let's get into firewood. It's my favorite topic, as everybody knows. Um, we see a really interesting pattern of firewood usage, which is that, of course, um, about 50% of people never use firewood at home in any way, and a different 50% of people never use firewood away from home for recreation or traveling. Um, but then the people that do break into some pretty interesting patterns. There's a lot of occasional users, one to four, one to five times. These are because the these kind of goofy numbers that don't align are because these surveys were done in different ways um, years ago. And then we've been grandfathered into those um, chunks of data over time. So we have to keep using them to keep the data clean. So that's why they, they don't align perfectly. But you see this sort of middle range, the, the sort of rare-ish user is kind of a rare beast. And then with the burn at home, you get a lot of folks who are gonna be in the 11 or more times category because they're actually heating with wood. And that brings that category up all the way to a quarter um, of the American public uses it 11 or more times. Um, whereas that use at home aspect of home heating obviously doesn't apply if you're not at home. If you're using firewood recreationally in some sort of traveling type activity, um, so you don't get that big bump. Uh, this data is complicated, but what it shows is that when you use the parallel samples that we have over large spans of time, we can now show that fewer people across both regions and the nation are moving firewood. Uh, it is worth noting that they are admitting that they are not moving firewood as opposed to we cannot actually say if they're telling us the truth. So there may be the possibility of some people lying to us. But the dark green is our sample from 2007, which was a really excellent sample, but regrettably it only incorporated the New England region, oh, I'm sorry, the Northeastern region and the upper Midwest. And then we can compare that to a nearly identical, I believe it's one state different, 2016 sample. So when you look at dark green to light green, you see the number of people that admit they move firewood five or more times a year has dropped to almost half. The number of people that admit to moving firewood one to four times per year has dropped by more than a half. The number of people who say they move firewood once every few years statistically not significant, up one, but that doesn't matter. It could be identical, it could even be less. We don't know that. And the number of people who say they never move firewood has jumped up in comparison, which is excellent. This is what we wanna see. And of course, this is a high impact region of the United States for the firewood message and firewood related um, pests. The New England, Northeast, actually, you know what? I forget if this is Northeast or New England, so sorry about that. I'll have to look it up later. Uh, now, we also have 2016 national data, and that shows clearly that the current sta status of the nation is better than the high impact areas of 2007. We don't have national data for 2007, so we can't say for sure what the nation was doing, but it's a very logical step to say that adherence in 2007 would have been at its likely national high 
in this area of New England and the upper Midwest. And so when we look at the nation and it's even better than back then, I think that shows that there's a very good chance that firewood movement nationally also over time has decreased significantly. We can't say it for sure, but it's a logical conclusion. So this is a great slide because we can say for a high impact area, we've made a huge difference. And in all likelihood for the nation, we've also made a significant difference. Additionally, we know how far they say they've been moving firewood. And this is um, the same exact sampling issue presents itself in this data. So I'll go through each line um, so that you can see what there is on the slide. People who say that they only move firewood 50 miles or less in the high impact area that we surveyed in 2007 and then pulled data to replicate in 2016, um, more people are saying when they do move firewood, they only move it under 50 miles. So they're adhering to the rule of thumb that has been used widely by outreach specialists for the last decade. They then say that when they do move firewood, they move it this far a heck of a lot less. So basically the people willing to admit that they move it 51 to 100 miles has dropped. Um, and then, <laughs> then I'm not sure what's going on with the data here between 101 and 200 miles. It seems to be that there is a slight increase in people um, that are willing to move it longer distances. It's not really clear why that might be. It's also not a huge difference, so I don't really know what to make of it. Um, in terms of the national level data, we're also seeing uh, that people who are willing to move who say that they do move firewood are, are not moving it particularly far. And, and you see this orange drop off of how far. Now to simplify this data, I actually made another slide to make it a little easier. So this is people who are adhering to the rule of thumb that a lot of outreach specialists actually promote, um, including the Don't Move Firewood campaign whenever we can. And that is, what about the 50 miles? So are you moving at 50 miles or less? And the answer is, more people say when they move firewood, it's 50 miles or less. Um, and less people are moving it over 50 miles in our tightly sampled region where we have longitudinal data. Nationally, we could do a lot of improvement to get the national behaviors as stated closer to this highly impacted area. But um, it's still very similar to the baseline that we saw in the impacted region in 2007. All right. Um, there's only seven participants in this uh, webinar at this time. So I was thinking I might take you guys off of mute as long as everybody promises to remute um, in case anybody has questions. So let me see if I can do that. Hmm. Call controls. Nope. I apologize for not knowing how to do this off the top of my head. This is the first time oops, that I have used this particular uh, location. Okay, here we go. So I think I can pull you guys off mute. Darn it. I don't know how to do it. Um, all right, we're just going to keep going then. I'm sorry, guys. All right, so let's go to the next slide then. Uh, two in five people nationally have heard that they shouldn't move firewood. And that reflects well on the other activities that I just showed, the um, whether or not they move it and how far they move it. This is this similar data. Um, you can see that between 2010 and 2016, there is a non-significant, unfortunately, increase in the number of people who say they know that they're not supposed to move firewood. Um, and there is no difference between the oversampled area um, in 2007 and the 2016 national, which is interesting. But when we break that data into regions, we see an entirely different picture. There are parts of this country um, according to that map that I showed before, that actually have gotten the message extremely well. And then there's parts of the country that have basically not gotten the message at all. 
Um, the best example of where we've gotten the message out extremely well is that East North Central region, the most highly impacted region by emerald ash borer. Seventy percent of people are like, oh, yeah, I've definitely heard about how you shouldn't be moving firewood from place to place. Likewise, West North Central, which is um, closer to sort of like the Great Lakes and so forth. That still has a really huge number of people who know that they're not supposed to move firewood. New England, which is, relatively speaking, a newer impact area when we look across the span of 11 years, is it just about 50-50, which is remarkable. I feel like that's a real achievement, um, given the fact that the threat there is newer to the larger region. And then when you get over into where I live, Mountain, we are embarrassingly low. Um, our impact has been really low and our outreach has been, um, our impact from pests thus far has been quite low and our outreach success reflects that. We have not had enough proactive outreach to educate the populace on that. Uh, the Western states has a better than mountain states record right now, uh, but still pretty darn low, which is disappointing. I'm gonna, I put this slide in so that everybody could look at the regions again, formulate questions in their head, and then I'll flip it back to that one in case you wanna look at it again. Ready? Okay, so those are where we're at. Drastically different according to where you are in the country. All right, so we'll flip on to the next one. Now, this is a complicated slide, so I'm gonna take it one at a time. If you don't, if you say you never move firewood, you're also far more likely to say that you've heard this message from somewhere. Likewise, if you use firewood, you're a lot more likely to say that you've heard messages pertaining to the movement of firewood. Now, these are both extremely intuitive statements, but they're also borne out in our data. So firewood users, that's the group on the left, versus people who say they never use firewood. The firewood users say they've heard this message 3% more, which is barely statistically significant. Um, it's actually not according to our uh, significance. But then once you get to folks that say, I never move firewood, then they prominently has show that they also say, I've heard the message. I never move firewood and I've heard this message. And that's a big difference there. So that's important and what we would hope. Interestingly, men are more likely to say that they've heard that they shouldn't move firewood. Now, I don't know if that's just because men claim they've heard things when they haven't even heard them or if that is because men actually have heard this message more. I do know that we have in our data, deeper in the data, the fact that more men say they use firewood than women say they use firewood. So it may be that the gender effect is actually not due to, the gender effect of having heard the message is actually due to the fact that there's firewood users versus non-users sort of conflating these um, two different pieces of information together. Nonetheless, men are more likely to say that they have heard this message that you should not be moving firewood from place to place. Uh, the age groups that we were talking about earlier in terms of concern also are reflected in who's gotten the message. So the 50 to 64 and then the 65 to 74 group says they've heard the message the most. Um, I'm not sure why that is. I think it's interesting. I wonder perhaps if this is a group that concern that consumes traditional media at higher rates, so they're more likely to have read a newspaper article, but that's just my opinion as to where why this trend might be occurring on the data. And when you ask people, okay, so have you you've heard the message for don't move firewood? Um, and they say yes, and then we ask them, so did that message actually make you less likely to move firewood? They say yes. We can't actually tell exactly why our made no difference is at 25% because there is a logical break in the made no difference group. Half of the made no difference group, let's just say for the sake of argument, might be it made no difference because they already don't move firewood ever. So of course it made no difference because they're not going to move it. And then the other half is going to be the it made no difference because I'm not going to listen to you. We don't know where that break is. It could be one to 24%. It could be, you know, 12 to 12, hard to say. 
but that made no difference group is not differentiated between the two potential reasons for made no difference. Of note is the fact that the total number of people who say, oh yes, this makes it much less likely that I'll move firewood is 64%, which is pretty compelling. And also, again, 50 plus 15 does not add up to 64. That's just one of these rounding errors that sneaks into the percentages. When you ask people aware about whether or not they're aware of firewood laws in their um, area, they have very variable responses according to their demographic groups. Now, for instance, when you look at the Midwest Census region, 34% of people say, oh yeah, I'm aware there's some sort of law or regulation in my area about firewood. Whereas when you look at the Northeast Census region, it's only 12%. Now there are more laws and more regulations in the Midwest. So you would actually expect this to happen. Um, when you get into um, the parts of the country where there truly are no local firewood laws or regulations, people say, no, I've never heard of this, which is good. That means they're actually telling the truth. And that's helpful to know that people are willing to admit they've never heard of it when truly they've never heard of it. In terms of all voters across all of the United States, it's a pretty low number. It's 15%. But of course, parts of the United States don't have a law. There is also a really significant difference in people um, claiming they've heard of one of these laws or regulations when you talk about where they live, the highest being a small mid-sized city and um, less than half that being if they come from a suburban area, what they claim. So their awareness level as stated varies. Um, I also picked out the highest group by gender and age. And the most aware group is men 50 and over. And the least aware group is women 18 to 49, which is a big, as the statisticians say, is a big bucket of people. Um, but we don't have enough data to divide up into smaller buckets. And that's why we have to do it like that. So there's a lot of variation in the awareness. Um, when people say that they never move firewood, they're also far more likely to say that they're aware of the laws, which is very intuitive. So, you know, I know it's against the law and I never do it is a really logical line of thinking. And that line of thinking shows up in our data very clearly. If they know, um, if they never move firewood, they're more aware of laws straightforward. Likewise, if they don't use firewood, they are less likely to say they're aware of the laws. I don't pay attention to the laws of things that I absolutely never do either. So this is a positive result showing that um, the message is probably getting more to the people that need it and less to the people that don't. We have this stock statement that we've been reading to people since 2007 about the issue of forest pests. And when they, I could read it to you, but I won't use the time for that. When they hear this statement, then we say like, so how willing are you to buy firewood where you'll burn it after you've heard this? The overwhelming majority, um, an almost equivalent number of people across time always say, oh, definitely I'd be willing to buy firewood where I burn it. I think that's a really good preventative measure or whatever it is that they say. Um, and this is one of the most consistent results over time that we see. Interestingly, over the course of the last nine years, it has dropped a significant amount in terms of just statistical significance. So we're down to 84%. Um, I'm not sure why that is. I, I have no speculation. It seems like an odd result to me that it would go, go down. Um, but the total not willing is not statistically different. It's actually the don't knows that are driving this, if you look at this. So 6% of the don't knows are enough to make this. It's unclear. So it's sort of a mystery as to what's going on with why more people say they don't know. All right, so as a outreach professional who does this day in and day out, this was one of the most exciting things for me to see. Where do people claim they will actually listen? And where they claim they will listen is the point of action. So they claim they'll listen if somebody hands them something when they go into a state park. That makes perfect sense. When they are making a re reservation, this has been a huge push for the Don't Move Firewood campaign. Um, we work with reservation sites constantly to make sure that information is on the reservation slip. Um, and so that was really positive for me to see that this effort is well received. 
uh, poster where you sell firewood. That's very logical. That's what a lot of people are doing. Interestingly, the label on firewood packages, obviously there's this link between the firewood itself and the movement of it in people's minds. But in my opinion, it's almost too late by the time somebody sees a label on a firewood package. They've already decided what it was they were going to do with it. So even though the public thinks this would be effective, I wonder if this maybe isn't the best strategy. And of course, people trust their friends and neighbors. So if their friends and neighbors tell them about the problem, then that is something that they think that they will listen to. And that's good. There's also this interesting result where as we go down the line of different places where people could get information, we start seeing some interesting problems with different potential locations you could deliver your outreach message. So for instance, the first line here, a news article, that seems genuine. That's in the front of the news where you're going to read it. But then if you go down back to the bottom, you see an advertisement in the newspaper. I wouldn't have guessed that you'd see a fairly significant drop in um, people stating that they'll listen to it. But certainly they do. You know, this is not the same result whatsoever. Um, the uh, booth at a uh, farmer's market, etc. cetera, um, that's a strategy that my program has taken through uh, our years of outreach. And people do definitely um, respect that one, but it's a lot less effective than some of the more on-site, at the moment of camping type outreach moments that we saw on the prior page. <coughs> Excuse me. I hope that wasn't too loud to everybody. All right. All of these slides we can um, distribute when we're done, by the way. So if you're scribbling this down or taking screenshots, I'll be able to send you the PowerPoint. All right, so here's one of the questions that everybody's debating for years. And um, I did this two different ways because I wanted to find out. I should have done it about 10 different ways, but I did the best I could. When two candidates are allowed to split the vote between um, the non don't move firewood slogans, the slogan that professionals think is most effective when they're when professionals in the field of forests, firewood, invasive species, etc., are asked, which of these do you think is most effective? And they're given these three candidates. Don't move firewood is a clear leader. You get about 50% of the vote. Professionals in the field forced to split their vote. Now think about this in our current election, right? The splitting the vote is a major concern. And if you add up buy it where you burn it, and buy local, burn local, which, by the way, is used in Canada and Vermont and nowhere else, just so you have a little reference in case you've never heard that one. Um, that adds up to almost, uh, well, what does that add up to? 53%. So it's actually more than Don't Move Firewood once you put those two non-Don't Move Firewood slogans together. So I got these results actually way back in June. And I thought, oh, that's a problem because I don't actually know what would happen if we did a one-on-one. -on -one. So when we did our national survey of the public, we did one-on-ones. We did A-B testing, which means we asked half of the people between buy it where you burn it and don't move firewood. And then randomly, we asked the other half of the people between buy local, burn local, and don't move firewood separately. So nobody was asked both questions. Nobody was offered um, buy it where you burn it and buy local, burn local. And sure enough, when you use a two-party system, the public thinks buy it where you burn it is the most effective slogan. That is really fascinating. It speaks to the concerns that I've been hearing for years that don't move firewood is excessively negative, that it doesn't suggest a positive action or a next step. And instead, people really prefer strongly something that does suggest a positive action um, and a next step. They only prefer buy it where you burn it a little more than buy local, burn local. Um, not a statistically significant amount. However, in my experience, um, buy it where you burn it has been widely adopted throughout all the states, with the one exception of Vermont, who prefers buy local, burn local, and that's fine. That's their um, choice. And then also Canada, um, who has been using buy local, burn local. So this may just be a familiarity issue. Who knows? Um, but this is the results we got. And so the logical next thing for me to say is, how am I going, as the director of the Don't Move Firewood campaign, how am I going to react to this? And so I wanted to make sure that ended up on the conclusions. And I'll get to that in one minute here. Conclusions. 
I think these are the take home messages that we really need to look at. So we should be using what the public thinks is most effective. Buy it where you burn it, whenever it's applicable to your area and your situation. Professionals don't necessarily prefer it in all cases. So when it's impractical, like when certified heat treated firewood is required, so just saying buy it is not sufficient. Or when gathering firewood is actually much more logical in your situation, you should be using don't move firewood, but follow up with a positive action. The public does seem to really want that positive action and we should respect that. Um, another take home from the entire presentation is that outreach works, it is working. The public is saying it is changing its behavior in two ways. They are moving firewood significantly less. And when they are moving it, they are moving it shorter distances on the whole. So we're, we're doing what we need to do here. Um, another take home that I think everybody should make sure to internalize is this outreach needs to be done in the places where people are listening and we need to use those trusted messengers. Those slides, and again, I'll make all of these available, of the trusted messengers that people trust and the places where people are receptive to messages are really important to making sure that outreach is effective. And then, you know, some of the slides sort of suggest that awareness is sort of temporary. You know, things are changing. It's nothing, we're not always succeeding. We're not always building up. So I think one of the things I wanted to make sure everybody got is that awareness does seem to kind of fade and get squishy over time. We shouldn't give up. We shouldn't stop. Um, there is no point of finality here. So, you know, you should keep doing your outreach, keep using the slogans, keep on the work. And I think that's where we're going to end up being successful. Um, and on that positive note, that's my last slide. And I haven't got a clue how to turn on chat or turn you guys all off on mute, which is frankly a little embarrassing. Um, and so I will have to resort to looking at my email, seeing if anybody has emailed me questions. And again, my email is lgreenwood at tnc.org. And actually somebody isn't on mute. So who's that? Um, somebody... This is Annie at Karen's computer. Hi. Thanks. Hi. I just un I just un I clicked the unmute my computer button. Well, right there you go. Skype Thank you. Thing. <laughs> what can I do for you? Oh, I don't I, I don't actually have a question right now. I just wanted to see if it would work. <laughs> it um, worked. It did. <laughs> um, great. So uh, do you? Lee, I'll ask you a question. Hi, Faith. Hi. Um, in the regional differences yeah. of awareness um, about the message, and I'm sorry, I didn't write down the numbers. It's of okay. Slides, um, but as you noted, the uh, most of the South, once you get away from the Atlantic and move toward Texas, mm -hmm. it has a pretty low level of awareness. Yes. Um, Maybe this is more a comment than a question, but I think uh, you and I and maybe Frank Koch ought to work together to uh, link your data on awareness to his data on the numbers of people who are actually moving firewood, or at least back in 2009 were moving firewood to all the reservoirs and such like that are located in that region. Yeah, um, I agree that some of the regional data on who's heard the firewood message is worrisome. Um, you know, some of the currently lower impact areas having lower awareness is just the nature of the beast. But some of the currently higher impact areas having lower awareness, that's where it becomes worrisome. Um, and there are a few of these that we, I think, need to look at. For instance, the South Atlantic region um, has noticeably low awareness levels, but right now it has pretty high impacts. Um, and so I definitely think that that slide is a really powerful um, one to sort of bring to people and say, look, we can do this. We've changed. We've We've changed so much in the high impact areas that have been a high impact for a while. So East, North, Central, West, North, Central, basically the Great Lakes, Midwest. They're excellent examples of how this can be achieved, but it definitely hasn't been achieved in certain parts of the country that it needs to reach. And um, I did see on my email that Evelyn asked 
if I will email out the PowerPoint? Absolutely. Um, the reason it's so boring and doesn't have any photos is because I wanted to make it easily emailable. Um, Lee, this is Evelyn. I actually have a question as well. Good. What can I do for you? I was curious if you have any more demographic data besides gender. Oh, um, yeah. I have a lot of demographic data. Great. And I guess what I'm, I mean, I'm in Hawaii, so most of this data doesn't really relate to me. But nonetheless, I'm curious about how or if different ethnic groups responded differently to these campaigns. Hmm. That's a great question. We have um, a breakdown according to ethnic groups that's pretty broad. Uh, there, I deleted one of the slides that had, <laughs> to, to just keep the presentation within time, that had actually an ethnic breakdown according to one of the messages. We see differences between the different ethnic groups. Noticeably, if I'm remembering correctly, Hispanics are more concerned about forest pests and pathogens than other major ethnic groups, including African Americans versus, um, I actually think it's labeled whites, uh, and a couple other, possibly Asian as well, I don't recall. Unfortunately, because of our sample size, to be frank, we don't have enough data to see differences that actually may be there, but subtle. Our, our survey si size, when you dice the data by ethnic group, often doesn't show differences. And that suggests to me that maybe we just can't see the differences. Um, but there are noticeable differences in a few categories. Is there, um, can you share that separately with just with me if nobody else is interested? Oh yeah, in absolutely. I mean, I could show it to everybody. Um, it's, it, it's deep, deep within the data and it might be something that we should like look at the same document and talk on the phone about because it's kind of hard to read this data when it's uh, raw. Um, it gets really complicated really fast. Okay. Um, I see there's a few other people on the line. Um, does anybody else have a question or comment? Okay. Well, um, I'm. Lee, this is this yes, is Faith. Faith again. Sorry. I hear you. No problem. Um, did I? Did you say that the description of the pest threat uh, is the same one that we've been using throughout? Yes. 2007 or 2005. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the, the the change then the change in um, willingness to say that uh, they'll change their behavior must come from something other than our effort to educate or concern them. Yes. Our, sorry. Yes. Right. So one thing that I, I am very, very aware of and um, right. as are the pollsters that wording matters. And so whenever we had existing exact wording from a past poll, we always replicated it 100%. So that script that you're referring to, um, it's it's actually a little dated as a result of this because it's the 2005 script that we've now been using for 11 years. And you know, if I was in charge of it, I'd rewrite it, but then I would make the survey useless. Um, so it's identical. And so whatever the differences are, we are seeing it's because something that's happening in our world that is making people react to the identical script differently. And that's the case for any of these questions um, where we have multi-year data. The question is 100% identical. The only differences are sometimes regional sampling, um, which gets very tricky over time, especially when you're talking about multiple different samples. Um, so I've, I'm doing my best to deal with the regional sampling issues to make sure that we're comparing apples and apples on regions, because as you can see, especially from the data on awareness, those regions can be grossly different. And so sampling them incorrectly has really significant ramifications. Hey Lee, this is Paul Kingsbury in Tennessee. Hey Paul. Hey, um, with the data that you've collected here and seeing how important it is to have messages as close to the point of action as possible for mm -hmm. um, campers and people who are uh, using firewood 
does that change your social media strategy in any way? Because I saw that Facebook seems to have a pretty low engagement on this. Yeah, so I feel like that data should have some interesting um, sort of take homes for both my work and the work of, you know, my sort of professional circle on firewood. It's important to remember that all of this is what people think, not what they really do. So people think they'll pay attention to, um, you know, an uh, article in the newspaper, but whether or not they really do is a whole nother question. Um, so I, you know, this is, it's one of these moments of sort of reflection, you know, are you, I'm going to be writing my 2017 work plan soon. And when I do that, how am I going to use those pieces of information most intelligently? How am I going to use the fact that people prefer a different slogan than the one we've hung our hat on? For since 2008. Well, you know, it's something we're really going to have to think about. Um, how am I going to get more brochures into state parks? State parks that are already underfunded and too busy to hand out brochures. Is that something I can do? I'm going to have to figure that out. And I think that's the most important thing about the polling is, you know, taking a deep look at the data and making sure that every time there's something that's actionable about it, that we do it to the best of our abilities. But yeah, I mean, people say they don't really listen to Facebook very much. I'm not sure that's true, but that's what they report. It'll be interesting to see how that, if that data were parsed more finely, if you could see how that affects different age groups. Oh, I could totally look at that. That's one that I have. Yeah, all of these, it would be interesting to find out. If you want to actually find out, I have the data. All you have to do is... <laughs> okay. <laughs> All you have to do is email me the question because I could, for instance, pull that right up and say, oh, look at that, you know, 18 to 25 year olds say that they listen to Facebook the most out of any demographic group. I, I'm not looking at the actual data. I don't know if that's true, but I could easily I could tell you right off the top of the document. OK, well, I'll be following up with some email questions. There you right. go. Yeah, it's really deep data. Um, we're already over time, so I'm going to finish up here. It's really deep data. And so if you have questions that you think you want answered, I, I'm thrilled to answer them for you, but there's no way I can cover everything in a PowerPoint presentation. So, all right, and with that, I am going to turn off the recording and turn off the webinar. I really appreciate everybody that came and any feedback that you can provide to me about what you think was most important um, and what questions you have is really valuable to me. So please email and I appreciate it. everyone coming in. Thanks, Lee. Thank you. Thank you.